We finished produce. Guess what's next? Fungi. Um, here's the plan. So we have an exam on Wednesday next week, right? It opens on Wednesday and closes on Thursday. So we have today and this Wednesday and then Monday to finish the rest of the stuff that will be on that test because I won't test you on stuff to cover on Wednesday on the exam that opens Wednesday, right? So a week from this part. I'm saying nine days from now because I don't fall in that, right? So on your syllabus, what chapters are listed for exam two or the midterm exam? Anybody have the syllabus handy or have it written down? I'm happy to pull it up, but just seeing if anybody has it. So as I said earlier, uh, with exam one, we did this already. I'm never going to move the date of the exam. Okay, so those are in the syllabus. That makes it easy to sort of plan your life, at least as much as you do around exam dates, right? So I'm not going to move the tests on you guys. So those are listed in, in red on the calendar, and they will always and forever stay exactly where they were placed, unless something unforeseen happens. But I don't imagine that to be the case. So unless something weird and crazy goes down, that's going to be what happens, okay? So for the midterm, remember it's cumulative. So you'll see some review of stuff that was on the first exam, but not a ton, about a quarter, right? So like 25 out of 100 questions. This exam will definitely be 100 questions because we have so much material to choose from for this second exam. Um, it says 23, 22 to 26 and 30 and 31, okay? But we didn't do viruses on the first exam. So you will see virus questions, so chapter 21. Yes, maybe write this down. Chapter 12, I'll post it on B2L also, so you don't have to, but just make sure you're thinking, thinking along with me here. So chapter 21, 22 was on prokaryotes, right? So your bacteria in our hay chapter. 23, we just did with protists and endosymbiosis. Okay, so those three chapters. 24, we will get through as far as we can today in fungi. And then 25 and 26 are on plants. So 25 is seedless plants and 26 is seed plants. But they're basically all just one is the continuation of the next. Um, I think if we do not have time, what I'll do is cut out 30 and 31. Okay, so 30 and 31 are continuation of plant stuff. They go into plant physiology, um, whereas 25 and 26 are mostly about evolution and diversity, like we've been looking at um, with the other groups. So if we have to slash and burn 30 and 31, we'll do it. Okay, because what I really want to do is get us to the point where after midterm, we switch gears and go into animals, because we have a ton to cover animal evolution, animal physiology, body systems, like human body systems, because we're animals, yes. Um, and then all the stuff on college. So we're gonna, we're still gonna hit the plant pathway mark at midterm, right? Okay? So the plan is 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, all right? And I think that's gonna be as much as we have time to get through. So for now, you can think in terms of uh, omitting 30 and 31. Um, I will probably also cut some content out of both 24 and the 25, 26 combo. Um, which I haven't posted those PowerPoints yet, but I did post 24. All right, so fungi is up already, and I posted it before I thought about having to um, cut some stuff out. So as we go to the lecture on chapter 24, I'll tell you what to omit. And then I'll go back and amend your study guide so that you can see what you do and do not have to know for the fungi chapter. Um, just because, yeah, time. And there's, and there's, yeah, I'm not too sad about the stuff we're going to have to omit. You guys okay with trimming it down a little bit for, for content? Cool. If you're really sad, we can meet outside of class hours and talk about fungal life cycles. Far be it from me to deny you a discussion on sports. I'd never do that to you. Okay, there's also an outline posted for chapter 24. Um, it's just notes that are sort of some of the stuff in the in the PowerPoint itself is just picture like picture related um, that I thought needed a little bit more explanation in, in terms of words, but some of that will cut too. So I'll edit that as well. I don't know here. Okay. Here. What are fun now, you guys? What do you think of when you think of Fungi or fungus. Hmm? 
I'm sorry, it's okay, you're right. The song? Um, Are you giving me a genus? Yeah, no, just. Um, so what kind of organism is B cell? B -cell uh, I don't know. Okay. Is it like a yeast or a mushroom or? Yeah, it's a mushroom. Mushroom. So most of that, right? You think about fungi, you think about mushrooms, right? If you think. If you think about anything, when you hear the word fungi, it might be mushrooms, right? So there, here are just some pictures of some common types of fungi. Uh, you got your puff balls, those exploding ones. There, if you've seen these, kick them, they explode out everywhere. Okay. I will post you a video of one from my yard. Um, it was very exciting. It got it hit with a, I think it was a, I think it was a stick, a baseball bat, or something like that, and I got covered in spores. It was very exciting. It's a short video. I'll, I'll try to find it for you. We usually think about mushrooms. So we're thinking about mushrooms, we're thinking about yeast, um, mold. Yes, these things are all fungi. What did we say? Uh, we're, so, okay, let me rephrase this question. When we're talking about phylogenetic trees of life in general, where do the fungi fall? I'm actually going to go a little bit forward and pick that up. Who are they closely related to? Someone said it. Animal, yeah. So here's our here's our tree that we looked at. This tree is a little different. Remember, I told you guys there were different ways to group these eukaryotic supergroups. Um, so this tree had the uh, Opisthocotta and the Nebozoa together in one big group called Anacotta, which is fine. You guys don't need to know that. Okay, this is just an illustration to remind you where fungi and animal animals fall on the tree. So their sister, if you take out these two, you take out these single-celled protists, the nucleus and the chlorophyllic. Um, there's a node right here that makes fungi and animals a system. So we're pretty closely related to the fungi, and there are some similarities. So we're going to talk about that a little bit as we look at the characteristics of fungi. Okay, so same theme that you guys have seen so far in the virus chapter and the prokaryotes chapter and the protist chapter, characteristics comes first, and then we'll talk about some groups, okay, notable species and things like that. Um, so fungi comes from the Latin word spongos, which literally translates to mushroom, so that's where the name comes from. You may also see the term eumycota. So the, the suffix, I mean, the root word myco, M-Y-C-O, refers to fungi. Okay, so that's just a good fact to commit to memory moving forward. When you see myco in a word, it's almost always in biology referring to fungi sometimes, okay? So you means true, like eukaryote, right? We talked about that. So eumycota are just the true fungi. That's just another term for the group. Um, lots of species. Over 100,000 identified, but probably over a million species present on Earth. Why are there so many more species likely around than what we've identified? Just because we haven't identified them yet. Um, that's another thing that you guys will see continuing through each of these groups is that there will be an estimated number of species, right, that have been identified and taxonomically grouped. But that there's always more, and there's always an estimate of how many more. Okay, you guys don't again need to memorize those numbers, but just be aware that that's the same theme you'll see throughout each of these groups. Is that here's how many we know of, here's how many we've identified, but there's probably a whole lot more. All right, because we're always finding new things or reclassifying things. Like maybe there's a group of fungi that we think are all the same, and then molecular systematics tells us that they're drastically different. Okay, so there's always room to, to change those classifications. Uh, some examples we mentioned, uh, edible and inedible mushrooms. Do you think more mushrooms are edible or inedible? Inedible, yes. The ones you can eat are more the exception than the rule. So if you're wandering through the forest, do not just eat the mushrooms, okay? Yeah, lots of them are toxic, you know that, right? At the very least, you might take a hard hallucination trip, right? Okay, uh, yeasts also. Okay, we'll talk about those. Black mold, you guys have probably heard of that. You may have to move out of your um, apartment or something if you get black mold in your in your walls. Penicillium notatum. Why did that species ring a bell? Penicillin, yeah. So the fungi that's responsible for the discovery of antibiotic compounds. Um, all fungi are eukaryotes, but you guys already know that. Why do you already know that? I don't even have to tell you. And we covered prokaryotes in a single chapter, yes? So everybody from there on forward is the eukaryotes. So fungi eukaryotes. 
They're also in those eukaryotic supergroups on the trees that we've looked at, and they're sister to animals. So eukaryotes, complex cells, not photosynthetic. Okay, this is a key trait. For many years, fungi were classified alongside plants. Why do you think that is? Why would taxonomists put fungi like mushrooms in the same groups as plants? Kind of looks like a plant. What does it do that looks like a plant? Grows out of the what? The ground frequently, right? Just kind of looks plant-like. They're also mostly sessile, like they don't move around, right? Kind of like a plant in most cases. Some do. We'll look at the exceptions here in a second. Um, but as we know more about, as we learn more about fungi, and we have genetic information, and we also have, and they have figured out that there are zero examples of photosynthetic fungi. They all have to eat something else. They're all heterotrophs. Okay, so that's kind of an interesting parallel with animals. Yeah, no photosynthetic members, no exceptions. That's nice, because with protists, there were nothing but exceptions, right? Remember, it's a big catch all group, but fungi are not like that. So, all eukaryotes, all um, heterotrophs, they have cell walls, kind of like plants, but instead of being made of cellulose, we'll, which we'll talk about more in the next chapter on plants, they're made of chitin. Also, an interesting parallel in the area of some research is where does chitin originate? Okay, do you guys know what chitin is? Anybody had zoology? Yeah, Michael. Isn't it the stuff that uh, a lot of animals make their exosomes? Yes, exactly. Yep, same thing that, that insects and other organisms that make an exoskeleton use in that exoskeleton, chitin, same molecule. So if we look back at the tree or forward of the tree, um, you know, did that chitin originate back here? on the branch that leads to all of the epistocots? Is that why fungi and animals share it, or is it a derived trait? So there's some interesting research out there about that. Um, we're not going to go into it too much, but just keep that in mind, right? As similarities and characteristics between those groups that are pretty closely related. All right, so we mentioned that everyone in the group is heterotrophic, meaning they have to eat things. Um, mainly, they are saprobes. What is a saprobe? What did we talk about? We, we introduced that term in the protist topic. Anybody remember what a sapo is? There's not even any hints on the slide, right? Really. Saprobes are organisms that um, do decomposition, right? They eat waste, organic material, waste material from living organisms, things like that. Um, so they break stuff down. So fungi are huge in the nutrient cycle. Okay, being able to break down uh, dead material or waste material and return those nutrients into the system, right? To be able to be recycled by other organisms. Um, so you get lots of decomposers or saprobes. Think about like mushrooms growing on a rotting tree log. Yes, that's kind of a good visual to, to make you think about saprobic um, fungi. Some are parasitic. Uh, some are even predatory, which is pretty cool to think about. So there are... Um, Actually, some species of fungi that seek out uh, soil nematodes. Do you guys know what nematodes are? Anyone? Okay, we'll get to that in animals. They're worms, tiny little round worms that are found all over the soil. Um, there are a uh, particular, this Arthrobotus is one genus, you guys can click on that link and check it out if you want to, that actually uh, send their little hyphae. Let's go look at what that means here in just a second. Let me actually show you what I'm thinking about. These are hyphae, stringy. Uh, cellular components that are actually make up the majority of the vegetative structure of the of the fungi, like a mushroom. Um, they'll actually grow down into the soil, and instead of growing in these sort of grant formations, they make loops like little lassos, and they trap those soil uh, nematodes and basically squeeze them, and then suck out their uh, nutrients. Pretty gnarly for a fungus. Uh, the arthrobotus is pretty cool. All right, but any way you do it, whether you're decomposing or you're parasitic or you're predatory, um, all fungi are gonna do what's called external absorptive feeding. Okay, so they secrete exoenzymes. Do you guys remember what enzymes are? What's an enzyme? What do they do? It's, they can, right? So enzymes are generally just uh, catalysts, chemical catalysts that cause chemical reactions to go forward. In this case, we're definitely talking about breakdown reactions. 
decomposition reactions. Um, for digestion, do you guys have enzymes? Do we have enzymes for digestion? Absolutely. Where are they? In your stomach, in your intestines, right? Some of them come from your pancreas. You have a whole suite of them. We're going to talk about it in after midterm when we get the body systems. But we do all that digesting with chemicals inside. We have an internal digestive tube where our, our food moves through and is digested by these enzymes. And then we absorb our nutrients through our intestines into our blood. So we do all the same things. We do it inside our digestive tract. Um, fungi do it on the outside. So they secrete enzymes outside of their tissues onto the substrate that they're going to eat. So again, think fungi on a rotting log, mushrooms on a rotting log. It's actually secreting digestive enzymes onto that log and then absorbing the nutrients using these hypo structures. And so it's eating just like you and me, but doing it on the outside. And so that's how they do heterotrophy. There's a huge surface area made up of that hypo, those hypo structures. Okay, so we'll look at that again in a second. Um, they reproduce through spores, much like you see here popping out of these puffball mushrooms. Um, some of them use sexual reproduction, so they do recombination, they do meiosis. Remember, they're eukaryotes, so they can, right? But they can also reproduce asexually, um, just making their own spores when the going gets rough. Okay, so you can, you can see examples of both. Um, you also sometimes will see budding in unicellular forms like yeasts. Okay, so most fungi are multicellular, like a mushroom or something like that's going to be a multicellular fungus, but um, there are unicellular examples. In blood yeast that you use to bake bread or make beer or cause yeast infections. Okay, so those guys are going to be unicellular, but they're still fungi. So that's a huge list of characteristics, but that's the that's the gist. How do they eat? How do they reproduce? Um, eukaryote versus prokaryote and cellular. Okay, pretty straightforward. Same pattern, like I said. Okay. Minutes. Perfect. Okay. Terminology for fungal structures that I want you guys to know. I keep talking about hyphae. There's the word H Y P H A E. That's what I'm saying. Hyphae. Okay. Um, a single one of them would be a hypha. All right. So hyphae is the plural. Um, I can also call them hyphal structures, just describing them as hyphae. So a single one is a hypha. Multiple hyphae massed together in what's called a mycelium. There's that MYC again. So like myco means fungus. Mycelium is tissue that forms when um, hyphae clump together. Hyphae are really, really small. And they're microscopic, like single cell thick. All right, so if you can see it without a microscope, it's probably mycelium, probably a bundle. Okay, but these are just terms that go along with the structure. Um, that's in there for you too. You can see it with your naked eye. You're looking at mycelium. Hyphae are septate or cenocytic. Let's look at what that means. So septate hyphae, each one of these is a cell and they're separated by a hypha. I mean, I'm sorry, each cell is separated by a septum and a dividing structure of some kind. So you've got individual cells that are separate from one another. You can see those little dividing septa there. That's where septate comes from. You guys know what a septum is? Have you heard that term in other? Other context. Mitchell, you're nodding your head. Can you give me an example? Yeah. Septum. Yeah. Yeah, your nasal septum, right? It's the part that divides your, yeah, the two nostrils. So septum is just a divider. So septate means that the cells in the hyphae are divided. Um, and then cenocytic means there are no septa. Okay, they're just free flowing uh, cytoplasm in between, but still multi nucleate. So that's again just terminology. Cenocytic, no septa, septate, have septa. Okay. Even if they're septate, though, those dividers have um, pores so that the cells can communicate and things can flow between them. So things like nutrients and, and waste and things like that. All right, cool. Let's get into the groups. This is kind of interesting. I think the high points of this chapter are probably the groups and the weird things that they do, and then the notable species. Okay, life cycles are in here, but again, that's what we're going to skip in the interest of time. Okay, you guys are going to actually like me for that. <laughs> I promise. All right, so I will ask you guys to know the five major classifications of fungi um, as they exist today. So you've got Tetrodiomycota, Zygomycota, Glomeromycota, Ascomycota, and Basidiomycota. What do they all five have in common? Mycota. 
mycota, right? Remember, the fungi are the eumycota, so they have all five groups of mycota. We'll look at chytrids, zygomycetes, glomeromycetes, and these other two here as we move forward, so you don't have to know everything from this, this slide, but when you go back to study, it's a really good reference for the major characteristics, each one of which are listed here uh, for you, for each of those five groups. Um, another thing that's interesting to look at here are the number of species in each group, in each of the groups. So remember, there are about 100,000 species of fungi that we classified. Ascomycetes in the Ascomycota are by far the most diverse. Right? There are 65,000 species or so in that group, um, followed by the Basidiomycetes. So most of the fungi that we are going to look at are going to be either Ascomycetes or Basidiomycetes by a lot. Okay? So that's where most of those species fall. But then you have about a thousand species of chytrids, a thousand species of the zygomycetes, and only 160 species in the glomeromycetes. So it's a pretty small group, but they're hugely important. And we're going to talk about why. All right, chytrids um, are notable because they can A, move, okay, that's unique in fungi. They're the only fungi that can go from place to place under their own power. Okay, that's what motility means. Being able to use your own power, your own energy, your own body structure to move from one place to another. There's a difference between being mobile and being modal. You guys want to know what the difference is? It'll be helpful going forward because you will see the term motility as you continue through your biology education. Mobile just means you can be moved. If you get in your car and some, let's say, okay, let's say you're trying to be as still as, still as you can, not use any of your own energy to move. Can you still be picked up and placed in a vehicle and driven somewhere? Yeah, that's mobile, okay? But modal means you're doing it, okay? You're using your own power and own body structure to move from place to place. That's what these guys do. They have a flagella. They can swim. Swimming fungi. Um, because they are aquatic, because they can swim, they are closely associated with organisms that use the water like amphibians, okay? So these guys are notable, not just because they can they're the only ones that can move around, but they're also causing a disease called chytridiomycosis. Anytime you see a fungal infection, it's going to be called a mycosis. Okay, that term will come up again later in the slideshow. But chytridiomycosis is a skin disease that causes death in amphibians. It is not specific to a particular type of amphibian. Um, amphibians often use their skin to breathe, right, because they're kind of semi aquatic. Um, so if they get this infection, it's really bad for their population, and it's leading to a dramatic decline in biodiversity of amphibian species, particularly in the tropics. And we don't really know why. So it's not like many of the problems that you see in biodiversity decline that we can blame on humans. It's not really our fault that we know of, unless we have upset some balance somewhere that we haven't identified yet. But um, chytrids are just doing a number on amphibians. So if you're interested or, or read about amphibian conservation, you will definitely come across uh, chytrid fungi. Okay, so that's one of, why, one of the reasons that that group is notable. Um, a good bonus question would be to spell Batrachochytrium syndromatitis. It is like, I'm out. No. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. Maybe I won't do that. Okay. Zygomycota, there's not a whole lot to this group either. They are notable for their spores that they form. So they could come together, so it's sexual reproduction, and they make this super uh, tolerant, resistant, tough um, sporangium, which is just a fruiting body. So inside of this thing um, is where the spores are produced. And these things are so tough, you can microwave them and they'll still, their spores inside of them will still be viable. So they're just notable for the fact that they form a zygosporangium. Where, what is zygo? What is the this part of the word zygo? What does that make you think of? Zygo. zygo. And what's a zygo? First, yeah, first cell that happens after fertilization. So you've got two different mating types of fungi coming together, forming a zygosporangia. Super tough spores are inside it. That's it for zygo, zygo micro. Okay. All right. This is my favorite of the groups. Because it's really interesting um, symbiosis that's involved here. So these are the glomeromycota. These guys, remember, are the smallest group. They're only 160 species. So as far as diversity, they're very, very small. But as far as impact, they're hugely important. So 
let's talk through these terms. I think we'll have time for at least that with us. Yeah. Um, the, glero, the glomeromycota or glomeromyces, right, which you would call members, are characterized by structures called, called arbuscular mycorrhizae. We'll come back to that, which is a type of endomycorrhizae. We'll come back to that as well. That form inside of cells of plant roots that penetrate the cell wall but not the cell membrane. Okay. So a, a mycorrhizal interaction, but what does myco mean? Again, the MYCO. But yep. You guys know what rhizo means? I haven't really gotten to that yet. So you know Micah. Micah. Rhizo has to do with plant roots. Okay, so when you see rhizo, think roots of plants. This will also be helpful, just like committing myco to memory, commit rhizo to memory, because you'll see that again when we get to the next two chapters, which remember is all about plants. So rhizo means root. Mycho means fungi. What about endo? What do you think endo means? Inside, yeah. As opposed to what? What's the opposite of endo? Ecto, yeah. Ecto or exo, for sure. So endo means inside. So an endo mycorrhizal interaction is a mycorrhizal interaction that happens inside the cells. Okay, but what does mycorrhizae even mean if we haven't gotten to that part yet either? So mycorrhizae is an interaction between fungi and plant roots. What are plants good at making all by themselves? Through photosynthesis. Food, what kind? Sugar, yep, organic compounds. Guess what fungi are really good at getting? Not sugar, actually not as good at it. They're really good at getting inorganic nutrients out of the soil. So there are a couple of reasons for that. If you look at, um, this is a really, really close up. This is as well, um, draw, this is a drawing that's a micrograph, but these here, these individual compartments are plant cells, okay? These are individual cells that make up a plant root, okay? So if you're zoomed in far enough to see the cells, the plant root itself is probably enormous, right? But look at this yellow structure. That is a fungal hypha. A single one of those hyphae, right? Compare that diameter to the diameter of this hypothetical plant root, right? So if your if your hyphae is that little, the plant root is like this, huge in diameter. You guys with me? So fungal hyphae are way smaller in diameter than plant root, plant roots are. They're both growing down into the soil to pull up water and mineral nutrition from the soil solution. Yes, plants are. Compared to hyphae, plant roots are big and bulky. And okay? when you're looking at soil, soil is made up of particulate matter, right? Particles. It is easier for fungal hyphae to get down in between those soil particulates than it is for a big, fat, giant, bulky plant root to do it. Okay? Because of that, fungi are way more efficient at pulling nutrients, inorganic nutrients like nitrogen and phosphates and things like that, out of the soil than plants are. But plants need inorganic nutrients, right? Every living thing really needs both, at least complex organisms. So mycorrhizae is this close association, this symbiosis of fungal hyphae with plant roots. They live together and they touch each other and they share. So the fungi that are really good at harvesting inorganic nutrients from the soil pass it over to the plant, to their plant partner. Okay, what do you think the plant's giving the fungi in return? Sugar, yep. So it's a sharing of the nutrient relationship. Because remember, fungi can't make their own sugar because they're not photosynthetic, but they can share it with their plant uh, symbiote. So mycorrhizae is that symbiosis between fungal hyphae and plant roots in the soil. Okay, super important for all plants. Like 99% of all plants rely on mycorrhizal interactions. Okay, why is that so critical for us? What do we rely on plants for? Oxygen, what else? Hmm? Did you say nutrients? Yeah, food, right? Base of the food chain. 
okay, along with building material and clothing and all that other stuff. Without a healthy, robust uh, plant base of the food chain, our numbers are small too. Does that make sense? So big numbers of plants support big numbers of animals. Um, so this is really important. What's unique about the glomerulomycete is that they form endomycorrhizae, meaning that this symbiosis is not just close, it's inside. It's endosymbiosis, okay? It's cells within cells. But what happens here, this is what I'm talking about by saying it penetrates the cell wall, but not the cell membrane. Remember that plant cells have a cellulose cell wall. That's what you're looking at here in tan. And then the cell membrane is sort of that dark orange color. So the fungal hyphae penetrate the cell wall, the cellulose layer, that fibrous cell wall layer, but they don't actually go inside the cell membrane. So it's not technically cell within cell. It's cells, cellular extensions within cell walls. Okay, so if you want to get into the technicalities of it, but see how they're growing into those plant root cells. Really, really close association symbiotically without being completely the same cell. Okay. That's um, what glomerulomycota do. And the name for this, arbuscular, arbuscular means tree-like, okay? Arbuscle is, like think about Arbor Day. What do you do on Arbor Day? Anybody know? Or not old. You plant a tree. Nobody's ever heard of Arbor Day. It's kind of like Earth Day for old people. Apparently. Arbor Day, you plant a tree. Look it up, Google it, you'll believe me. Okay, so anyway, arbuscular means tree-like. So you guys see where that comes from, right? These are your arbuscular mycorrhizae. They look kind of branched like a tree. That's where the name comes from. So I don't know if that helps or not since you don't know what Arbor Day is, but that's where the name, that's where the name is derived, okay? So that's what is characteristic of glomeromycota specifically, are those arbuscular mycorrhizae. Very important for plants. 80% of plant species depend on this symbiotic relationship with glomerulomyces. So I said like 90 something percent of plants do mycorrhizal interactions, but 80% of plants do it with glomerulomyces, with these arbuscular mycorrhizae. So this group, even though it's small in diversity, only 160 species or so, is critical to the health of the plant community, right? For plants being able to get nutrients that they need to put on tissue that we need to eat, okay? Um, there's only one species in the entire group of glomerulomycota that doesn't make arbuscular mycorrhizae, that's what ATM stands for here, and that is this uh, geosiphon pyroformis. Guess what it does? It does the flip, okay? So instead of having uh, fungal hyphae invading a plant, it has a photosynthetic endosymbiont that lives inside of it. So it has the same relationship of exchange of sugar from the photosynthetic partner for inorganic nutrients, but geosiphon does it in, inside of the cell. So you've got a bacterium, a cyanobacterium called NASDAQ, that takes up residence inside the geosiphon uh, cell itself. So they're still doing that mycorrhizal endosymbiosis, but they're flipping it. Does that make sense? All right, so endosymbiosis, endomycorrhizae, really, really important for the glomerulomyces. We'll stop there. We'll pick up on Wednesday with um, ascomycetes and basidiomycetes. Remember, I'm going to go through and um, edit the slides. So I'm probably going to pull out keys on life cycle. Okay, that's good, right? Look at all these terms that you won't have to know. So I'll edit this and I'll edit your study guide more importantly. So I may even leave these slides in place and just edit study guide so you can see um, what has been omitted, but the slides are still there if you want to reference them for any particular reason. So we only have two more groups to talk about. Astromycota, basidiomycota. We'll talk about some pathogens. We'll talk about some beneficial fungi. And that's pretty much the end of that chapter. So we should be good to start plants on Wednesday, finish plants Monday, that's next week, okay? All right.